Good morning, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the program so far. And I have with me here two industry um, tycoons who will be talking to us about all of the innovations that are happening in that regard. I'd like to start with you, Mr. Marwan. If you could tell us about some of the, um, you know, biotech uh, innovations that you have um, at the Dubai Science Park um, that are transforming the personalized medicine. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me in this uh, wonderful event, and it's gr great to see a lot of uh, industry colleagues here. Um, at Dubai Science Park, our uh, story started back in 2005 with, um, with, with really a vision to make the impossible possible. Uh, and that was to create a biotech community out of nothing. Um, so we had to really think of, you know, what is the best way, what is the best model, and how do we create a community today that is thriving with more than 500 companies and over 6,500 um, you know, professionals working in the biotech, healthcare, medical devices uh, sector. Um, I think the, the, the genomics introduction into healthcare is really something that revolutionized how we look at healthcare. And a lot of it is, um, is you know, based in research and, and in discoveries and, and new molecules, etc. However, the emergence between uh, genomics and healthcare, in my opinion, is yet to come, uh, which is also exciting. You know, how do you really use all of that information, all of that data, to make better decisions for patients today? So, um, you know, I have a long list of examples. If I, if I talk about the companies in Dubai Science Park, but um, we have an incredible ecosystem of startups uh, in our incubator in addition to larger companies who are, um, you know, leaders in the, in the field. Absolutely. And can you tell us how might these innovations impact patient care when it comes to the UAE and beyond? So I think today on a clinical level, um, you know, doctors are obviously specialized, uh, whether it's oncology, cardiology, etc. And not still using genetic information because they're not trained to read that information. So the opportunity really lies in simplifying that information for uh, a GP, for example, to have a discussion with, um, with the patient about the future of health and what they should be doing in a very personalized matter. Uh, before any disease happens. You know, I think today we have that capacity, we have the information, we have the connectivity with the patient, but it is, you know, using the information and making it also feasible and sustainable for everyone. Thank you so much. I'll move to you, Mr. Neil. If you could tell us about how generative AI, which is a hot topic as well um, in the healthcare industry, how is generative AI is being utilized to optimize drug the candidates for cancers like the breast cancer? Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me and thank you to the leadership uh, and the leadership of Pure Health as well. Um, it's fascinating to be here. It's my second time here uh, and the commitment uh, and the enthusiasm to the healthcare industry and life sciences is truly impressive, so thank you very much. Um, as a bit of background, I, I run two companies, uh, one's focused on neuroscience, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and then one which I'm really representing today uh, is a fascinating company, Mongoose Bio, um, which is spun out of MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, and it truly is what we believe transformative um, cellular therapy that can treat both rare and common cancers. And this idea of using generative AI or gen AI uh, is really exciting and very applicable to what we're doing. And maybe I'll focus a little bit on that. Because um, as we know, gen AI is typically in healthcare used to evaluate, or people think of it as evaluating large data sets. And while that's very true, it's really used, and we're using it ac across the spectrum of life science kind of development of our T-cell therapies. And just really briefly, similar to CAR-T, we're probably a generation or two ahead of that. We're looking at T-cell, uh, TCRT, T-cell receptor, T-cell therapies. So a little bit different. Um, and this is 
the, the, the production of T cell therapy. So T cells are taken out of the patient, they're modified with a specific T cell receptor, expanded and put back into patients. And we use Gen AI across a whole range of steps. Uh, and the first one for us, one of the challenges in any uh, cancer treatment is the identification of novel targets. And TCRT allows us to look at intracellular targets. So we examined uh, 250 million spectra of potential internal intracellular um, antigens or targets. So we used AI to rapidly assess 250 million spectra and we whittled that down quickly to four novel targets that we have licensed that we're working on. Uh, from that, once we have those targets, we used AI to kind of optimize these targets. Uh, for example, looking at binding affinity and specificity. So very important to really optimize our targets. We then use AI to assess which antigens are gonna be presented uh, by which patient. And this is important here in UAE with your genome project. So using AI to examine uh, multiple data sets from individual patients so we know how uh, the presentation of specific antigens uh, will be affected in each patient. So personalizing uh, these T-cell therapies for each individual patient is all done with, uh, with Gen AI. So there's a ton of aspects, even all the way through commercialization, that AI, and we have an AI engine within Mongoose that we utilize at each step of the way. So it's an absolutely critical tool and probably deserves all the enthusiasm that people are giving it these days. Absolutely, and if we want to compare it to traditional methods, can you tell us about some of the specific advantages of this technology? Sure, I think that kind of some of the bigger advantages are in speed. I mean, as I mentioned, 250 million spectra that we're analyzing, we can do that much more quickly, analyzing uh, uh, genomes of individual patients. So speed uh, is, is really important, and when we're talking about breast cancer, which I know is very critical to this region, as it is in the US, uh, speed is obviously of utmost important, getting patients, getting patients the medicine they need quickly. So speed is one. Uh, looking at safety, we can use AI to look at um, potential uh, off-target toxicities. So speed, optimizing the targets, efficacy, side effect profile. And we can also use AI Different to, different to other kind of older technologies to speed clinical trial development. And also, and we don't think of it too often, also on reducing costs. We can use AI to look at the manufacturing process and identify ways to streamline uh, manufacturing, which can reduce costs in addition to get the drugs to patients in a much faster timeline. Thank you, uh, Mr. Neil. And my next question is uh, for both of my panelists. Um, if, could, if I could take you know, both of your points of view on the role of regional collaboration and investment and how both can actually advance biotech innovations and uh, uh, personalized healthcare. Uh, if I could take your view, Mr. Marwan. In general speaking, innovation does not happen in silos. You know, it needs lots of collaboration, lots of data sharing. And also, I think uh, market access is another important thing, uh, finding the right patients for the right therapy. And I think both Dubai and Abu Dhabi is very well positioned to be taking a leading role in driving innovation. And, um, you know, COVID really um, showed us, the, the pandemic, how, you know, we all came together and, you know, put solutions very, very quickly. And today, the ecosystem that COVID has um, really disrupted is something that we can use for our own benefit. And you see uh, lots of companies, including Mubadala, ADQ, investing in innovation and R&D. So we're no longer users of innovation. We are today, um, you know, innovating ourselves with the universities that we have, with, the, you know, strong academic uh, institutions, uh, which is also collaborating a lot with the industry. Um, and that bridge between academia and industry is something very, very important. 
At the same time, and I was talking to Neil um, in the break, is using markets like the US, for example, that are powerhouses of innovation. Uh, you know, innovation takes a very long time, huge investments, um, and, and that powerhouse that the US have is something we can collaborate with and provide access for a global market that is very far from the US. Um, and so I think definitely, you know, innovation is all about collaboration and um, there, there is lots to be done. I really like what you said, that we are no longer users of um, innovations. We are the innovators. Um, and I'd like to move to you, uh, Mr. Neil, if you could tell us about your point of view when it comes to this regard. Yeah, I think Marwan covered it very well. I mean, it's all about innovation, and we have to keep innovating, and we have to keep kind of applying the innovation to improving the lives of individuals. Um, and importantly, looking at collaboration locally and globally. And I've run companies, I've been fortunate enough to run companies in the US and in Europe, in China, South Korea. So I know the importance of leveraging kind of global infrastructure. But I think one of the huge advantages in the UAE is the commitment and the attitude by leadership. It's phenomenal, the, the ambition and the enthusiasm that comes from UAE to become a, a leading center. Um, and if I think about first, kind of the the, the local or the regional uh, collaboration, I think there's probably four areas which I would say that locally there needs to be a kind of collective thinking. One is around kind of prioritization and a little bit the strategy, looking at diseases, you know, which diseases does the region want to target? Because there's a lot of them. So being, you know, is this, is this cancer? Is it, uh, is it neuro? Is it rare disease? So kind of understanding the priorities of the disease, I think is really important regionally. Uh, I think also commitment to investment. This is a long-term commitment. So not only startup companies, which Marwan does very well, um, but also getting these products to market. That's a long-term commitment. And I think in, in the other area is probably um, training of individuals. So all about people um, and expertise locally. Uh, how do we train and how do we, how do we teach people the very sophisticated art of innovation and clinical trial development and commercialization. That's absolutely critical as well. And then I think the other area of regional collaboration before you look externally is on the regulatory side. I think the regulatory commitment to uh, moving these products through development to market to patients, which is ultimately our goal, in a rapid time point. So those four areas I think need to come together uh, in a collaborative way regionally, in addition to kind of leveraging the, the expertise from outside. Absolutely. And if we want to talk about the role of uh, the local stakeholders, like uh, research institutions, investors, um, health authorities, how can all of these stakeholders work together to strengthen life science ecosystem and actually pave the way for future uh, breakthroughs? Mr. Marwan, can you tell us about this? This is a very big question. <laughs> so all the stakeholders play an important role, you know, whether it's the regulator, the investors, uh, the industry. But I think uh, somebody needs to orchestrate this, right? Which areas do we need to focus on? What are the uh, talent gaps that we have? Uh, you know, what kind of investments do we need to look at? Um, and I think. Uh, without mentioning names, uh, the, the regulator you know, is doing a great job in orchestrating the strategy for life sciences. And, and that kind of you know, paves the way uh, for investors as well, because investors you know, like that assurance that this is an area that will eventually have some returns uh, on investment. Um, so they all you know, play a very important role. I think the, uh, the investment role in innovation is something that uh, is new to the region, relatively, uh, but we are seeing an increased uh, uptake in that. Um, we, you know, we are a, um, kind of, we like to see the innovation in front of our eyes, but a lot of it is happening in the labs. So it's very difficult to explain to investors that I have a great idea that is still, you know, work in progress. But that mentality, that mindset is changing because, you know, we're very blessed to have leadership who doesn't take no for an answer, leadership who wants to make the impossible, uh, impossible happen. So 
um, the role of the government uh, to you know set the the tone, the strategy, and obviously investors, industry, academia, they're all very important. What do you think about that, Mr. Neil? Yeah, and I think it's exactly true. And I think the the because I put together my map of of stakeholders in this environment, and there are at least eleven or twelve. Um, but it's really important who is in the middle kind of managing this. And again, I think the leadership in UAE is superb in giving direction. And again, this vision of where the industry, where they would like the industry to go. But when you look at, the, when you look at these stakeholders, uh, I mean, you start with the, you know, the scientists and the academic institutions and the clinical trial centers. You've got the, the genome project going on here. You've got the manufacturers who are really important. You've got the investors, the regulators, the patients, you know, the parents. Um, so there's a lot of these stakeholders and they need to really, really work together. Um, as you mentioned, Marwan, these, you know, there's no room and there's no time for silos. So coordinating these 11 or 12 or 20 stakeholders from investments to the, to the patient advocacy, to running those clinical trials, to supporting kind of early stage R&D at, the, at these institutions, um, and then taking this, these, these novel products into the clinic, having the manufacturers know, know how to make these products, whether it's cell therapies or biologics or small molecules, that expertise is really important. So there has to be this collective working together and people that can manage that network are, are, are special. It's not that easy to manage this large network. And then when you start thinking about, well, what do we have here in UAE? And then where are the gaps? So not everything exists here yet. Not everything exists in the US either. So where are the gaps and how do we work with outside um, expertise in the US, in Europe, in the rest of Asia to complement what we're doing here? And it's a huge effort, but that's why I think you know, conferences like these and summits like these and sharing ideas and knowledge and bringing all of us together is a huge advantage. Um, and we'll generate these relationships where we can learn from each other uh, and build a, you know, a, a significant hub here in the UAE. And I see this personally. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, it's, it's really important for me, having run com companies around the world, to bring novel medicines, whether it's starting from the US, but bringing novel medicines to people globally. I mean, I certainly believe that. I want to bring my novel cancer treatments here and work here locally with the researchers to bring more medicines and take these to the, to, to around the world at affordable prices. I think that's important to add as well. And Shaista, you mentioned it as well and a few folks earlier, the importance of, of balance and human health and working together globally to make this happen. And I think this, you know, we certainly have a huge advantage here uh, in UAE to make this a global hub as well, um, getting drugs to patients from this area. Just want to yes. add on um, the, the importance of the patient voice as well. You know, I think when you look at the entire spectrum of the different stakeholders, these are all you know, very large organizations, uh, government, industry, research, but many times we forget the voice of the patient, you know, and, and because I was Previously, two years ago, uh, part of a, a rare disease uh, society, um, I, you know, it was my first time to interact with patients directly and with families, and a lot of them were undiagnosed. You know, there were very, very rare diseases. But I remember one mother particularly who had a, a daughter who had the only um, disease in the entire Middle East, so super rare, but because she wanted an answer, to, to what's happening to her daughter. She did so many things and, you know, it gave people this purpose of, you know, we're doing research for a, for a purpose. We're touching lives. We're making somebody's lives better. Um, luckily, she was diagnosed in Boston, but she came back to Cleveland. Um, you know, her daughter is, I think, 14 now. She, she was told when she was about four or five that she will never make it. But she, you know, she's going to high school and I think finishing high school soon. So it was this collaborative effort of everybody coming together for one purpose. And you know, sometimes we're too busy doing so many things and we forget that we're doing it for the human life.
Yeah, that, that, sorry, just to, that's really, really important. I'm a huge fan of patient advocacy. Uh, I'm on the board of Bio in the U.S., and we spend a lot of time on patient. We have a meeting next, an annual meeting with all the patient advocates from around the world. Um, so not only does it help us design our trials and understand whether they're going to take our medicines or not, so they have a huge influence in how we develop our products, but it is the most motivating thing for all of us, I think, to work closely with a parent or a patient um, and watch their progress from something that we've done collectively. And uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more, Maron, that that's, that's probably one of the most important things that we should do, embrace the patient, because at the end of the day, we're doing this for them. Absolutely, and I think it's a very interesting and a very nice way to end our discussion. Um, I think we are all here actually to discuss patient voices and to you know, find a way to better support the patients around the world. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of these insights and for being with us today. Thank you.